Hi, I'm Rachel Barton Pine, and welcome to the very first episode of my new Concertos show, 24 in 24, Concertos from the Inside. Well, I wanted to kick things off with Mendelssohn because it is one of the most enduringly popular violin concertos and also one of the first that young violinists tend to learn. Um, so I first studied it, well, I first fooled around with it at age eight, but I first studied it like for real um, with Almeida and Roland Vemos when I was 10. And that was the first year I soloed it with orchestra, not the whole concerto in a row. I actually w had one concert where I played just the first movement. Then later that year, I got to play just the last movement with a different orchestra. Now this was for a family concert and they had a Wild West theme. So instead of wearing a ball gown, I had the option of dressing dressing up for the theme. Uh, of course, you know, I can never resist a costume opportunity. Um, so I wore cowboy boots, a blue jean shirt, uh, blue, blue, blue jean skirt, a checkered shirt, a big belt buckle, and I had my hair in braids. I could have even worn a cowboy, cat, um, a cowboy hat. In fact, the orchestra gave me one with the name of the orchestra on the brim. I still have it somewhere, um, but that wouldn't have really worked for my upbows. Um, but on the program, of course, were the usual suspects, Copeland's Hoedown, um, the um, William Tell Overture of Rossini, which of course has nothing to do with the Wild West and Rossini's opera, but um, you know, it's now we very much associate it with the Lone Ranger, so that all of this stuff... We think of galloping horses, and it starts with a trumpet call, right? The dun da 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 dun bum 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 and that actually bears a striking similarity to the trumpet call at the start of the third movement of the Mendelssohn Concerto. Dun, dun, da, da, dun. And then we have this whole thing. Which also could sound like galloping horses, even though I'm sure that's not what Mendelssohn intended. And so the embarrassing thing is, um, to this day, whenever that trumpet call kicks in, I always get this Wild West flashback, and I think, yeehaw, here we go. The opening is, um, gosh, it's one of the hardest openings in, um, I mean, every opening is hard in its own way of all the different concertos, but the Mendelssohn, um, well, let's put it this way. When I was 10, I once had an entire lesson on the first three notes. And that's not unusual. I've done similar things in master classes, um, trying to just get the right combination. First of all, it's the, the piece itself is cut time, and it's marked Allegro Appassionato. So it has to have, you know, kind of a, a certain amount of, um, you know, of energy to it, but it also has to be sweet. And you have to have the first note, the, the right length and the right um, articulation between the first and the second notes. And um, well, I used to do it with the up, up bowing because that's what I think absolutely everybody did. Um, trying to get the right amount of stop so it's not too much, not too little. Oh, that was, that was impossible. Um, but you know, if you can find the right quality in those first three notes, then you know what sound you need for the rest of the piece. So it's not like practicing the first three notes is actually just practicing the first three notes. It's really practicing the Mendelssohn concerto. So even if I played it 10 times here, that shift was a little bumpy. And let's see, maybe my uppo wasn't ideal. Or the way I came in with my down bow. No, but now I didn't like the way I emphasized that second down bow. Let's try a little bit different bow distribution. Yeah, none of those were bad. All of them would have been perfectly acceptable and unembarrassing, but it's like, okay, what exactly do I want? And can I actually do what I want consistently and then call upon it in the moment of performance? I always love to do vibrated notes up high. Um, so here I was tempted, because he doesn't tell you to diminuendo, I was really tempted for years to do this vibrator. And make a strong thing out of it. But then when I went back and read the correspondence between Mendelssohn and Ferdinand David, his dedicatee, I, 
I realized that Mendelssohn was, was reminding him again and again and again that everything has to be fluid, everything has to be easy, meaning there's not supposed to be any kind of muscular virtuosity or things that feel difficult or are overtly showing off. There's certainly moments of brilliance, but it's not about, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, um, you know, um, conquer the violin, right? So then I thought, you know what, my vibrated E up there just doesn't fit the aesthetic that Mendelssohn and so clearly um, wanted you to do so. Just a beautiful harmonic. But then I, I always have to remember with any technically challenging moment that I have to make music with it. And so what I think about when I'm doing those octaves now is making sure there's a good line because when you just like, oh look, I'm playing some difficult impressive octaves. <laughs> It's like, wait a sec, Mendelssohn wouldn't have just gone from all of this beautiful phrasing to suddenly, here's a broken chord, blah, 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 blah. Are we practicing our Carl Flesch now? So I always try to make a phrase going up to that first note. And interestingly, he only puts forte on those first octaves. And then fortissimo. theme of the, la of the last movement has so much character. Um, just like the teasing opening of the last movement, um, there are all these pseudo pianos that you don't expect, and then once you do expect them, then he doesn't do it to trick you in the other direction. And again, it's just got so much personality. <laughs> Yeah, that's so fun. Gosh, it's hard to hard to leave things out because I could easily talk for three whole hours, but um, we will have the Zoom call later on and then you guys can ask me questions and um, help direct the conversation. I'm super looking forward to that. Um, the, the biggest challenge overall for me with this piece is always where do I... Um, place it on the spectrum between classicism and romanticism. So later concertos, you know, have a lot of these expressive slides. Right, this kind of thing. Slurpy slides up and down, which are necessary to capture the, the, the right sound for that kind of music. In fact, next week's Glazunov concerto is going to become chock full of them. <laughs> and, um, and if you left them off, it would sound kind of... Um, oh, I don't know, like, like dull. Um, it's almost like ornaments in Baroque music, these, these slides in Romantic music. But Mendelssohn's concerto is a little bit more pure. Um, now I'm not using period style fingering since I'm not using gut strings or playing with an orchestra with period winds. So it is a little anachronistic, but within modern playing, I'm definitely um, going towards the cleaner side of the spectrum, but definitely not Mozartian because there's a lot of legato, there's a lot of um, you know, pushing and pulling of the phrase itself. And it's actually the worst of both worlds because I can't just make a good legato with a goopy slide um, or take a breath and make it clean that way. It has to be clean and legato, which is like so hard. Um, but that's definitely the place that I've found um, where I feel that the music works for me. Well, okay, so I'm going to warm up a few spots and I'll tell you why I'm warming them up. I'm gonna warm up the up, up, ups in the, um, the third page, I think it's the third page of the, of the last movement because I can do them, so therefore I want to do them since that's actually what Mendelssohn wrote. Um, and, but it's a question of making sure I have the right sound. Some, certain notes on certain strings have to be a little more hand, um, the lower strings have to be a little more arm, and it's always harder when you go from a lower string back to an upper string.
you enjoyed that now it's time for a few questions and luckily um, we've had a couple of people send them in by the way you can send in a question um, a written question and audio only or the best of all is video and we do have a couple of video questions um, the first one is from Kate hi I read that when the original manuscripts were discovered the musicologists found that the first movement was marked Allegro con fuoco instead of Allegro molto appassionato. Have you heard of this, and how has this changed your interpretation of the opening? All right, well, what a great question, and I'm glad to see that you've done your homework. Um, yes, as I mentioned, it took Mendelssohn six years to finish writing this concerto, and actually the Berenreiter edition, this Urtext version, um, has both the original, um, or, you know, his kind of unfinished version. I, I mean, it's the whole concerto, but it's like lots of stuff that he later changed. And then, of course, the one that we know, all know and love. And it's really interesting to see the differences. And in this particular case of his, um, his 
character marking at the start of the first movement. It's very revealing. Allegro con fuoco. Can you imagine? I don't even want to hear what that would sound like. For the da -da 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 -da. No, 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 no. But it does tell you that um, con appassionato, um, you know, what his, his, his final marking um, is kind of slightly less than con fuoco, but still something, you know, very um, heartfelt and, and a little bit maybe even a slightly agitado that it's Okay, well, thanks for the great questions, guys. And I'm about to hop on Zoom. I hope that uh, lots of you will join me and you can continue asking me questions about Mendelssohn or this concerto or practicing or whatever's on your mind. And I can't wait. Um, thanks again for watching today. And next week, it's going to be the Glazunov. Um, so I'm really excited about that one. Um, see you next week.